Good morning. I'd like you to transport yourself back this morning. You woke up and you, you stretched and you smiled and then you remembered. Remember the cross. You remember your rabbi, your Messiah, the tomb, the, the beams of the cross are shouting, what is God doing? And, and that causes me to ask, what, what am I doing? I mean, if his steps that I was following end in the tomb, if they have no lasting impact, then, then what hope do my steps have? Everything that I thought has been shattered. It's become useless. And, and then there, and then there's a commotion. And, and then Mary and, and the and the other Mary, they they come bursting in and, and, and they're 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 shouting. I can't tell if it's fear or, or excitement or, or, or confusion or some kind of combination of, of all of the above. And then they say that word. What? resurrected and then all of a sudden all of the broken pieces they aren't useless anymore you know the cross in our faith has seemed at least to become the central point of our faith we become hyper focused on the cross our, our jewelry, our, our clothing, our cars, they all indicate to the world that we are Christians because we emblazon the cross upon them. We sing the old rugged cross. We, we sing at the cross. We sing, lead me to the cross. We talk about it in our language. We say it's the, the crux of the matter, and that means it's the cross of the matter. It's our cross to bear. We even say when we've placed our faith in Jesus that we have come to the cross. Yes, and truly, we praise God for the cross, for without it, we would still be captive to sin, lost and alone. But, but, if it weren't for the resurrection, if Jesus had never walked out of the grave, if he had not spanned the gap between life and life eternal, then the cross would mean nothing. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. We've lied about God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life alone, we of all men are most to be pitied. Without the resurrection, what you and I claim, what we worship, what we live by, it's all worthless pitiful. So we praise God for the cross. 
and we praise him eternally for the resurrection. The resurrection. Resurrection. Reviewing with one of my, my grandsons last week what this day is all about, I, I, I explained, listen, it's not about eggs, it's not about bunnies, it's about Jesus. And, and he, he came back to life. He, he died on the cross, and then he was buried, and then he, he came back to life. And my grandson very nonchalantly looked at me and said, nope, that can't happen. I know, right? It can't happen, but it did. That's what's so amazing. Because that doesn't happen. He was dead. I mean, dead dead. Three days dead. Crucified by a professional killing squad dead. Run through with a spear dead. And like, like a public spectacle dead. And he came back. And, and I want to be a little bit more specific because technically, technically he didn't come back to life. He, he didn't dip his toe into death and then decide to stay on this edge. Jesus delved completely into the abyss of death and separation. He waded through its dark recesses and mined its utter and farthest depths. He went through death to life eternal. He went through it. He didn't come back to this life. He, he proceeded to a new life. He, he, he went to a resurrected life. He, he was different. He was still Jesus, but, but different. He didn't come back to this life that would have, again, made him subject to death, but he died, took all that it had, got knocked down, stood back up, brushed himself off, defeated it, and then became king over death. He kept walking. Death, where, where's your sting? It's gone. Whatever threat you had is gone. Your chains have been broken. The grave now stands open for anyone who follows Jesus. Paul continues to the Corinthians. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. You know, uh, Friday night, we celebrated a Passover meal. We talked about how the lamb was slaughtered to save uh, the Israelites from death and how this foreshadowed Jesus and how his death would save us. We talked about uh, yesterday was, was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was the day where, where the prayer was that life would come from the ground. And this was the day that Jesus lay in the tomb, and as he laid in the tomb for that day, there was a prayer that, that life would come from the ground, talking about the harvest, but certainly it applied, foreshadowed Jesus. And today, biblically, is the day called first fruits. This is the first of many the celebration of the first of many. This is the uh, a spring harvest day. This is the day where, where the first ripened stalk is brought before God. And we are giving thanks to God for his first fruit from the harvest. We trust that he was going to ripen the entire field just as he did with this one, this first one that we brought before him. This is the day that Jesus resurrected from the grave.
He is the first fruits. He is the first of many. Not just that Jesus resurrected and, and defeated death, but he resurrected. He is the first. And we will follow. Death has been defeated. We will follow the path that has been emblazoned by Christ over the, the, the impotent coals of death. He's defeated it for us, too. The cross is not the end. The fact that Jesus walked out of the grave means that it's just the beginning. Jesus, with his resurrected body, impervious to death, focused on God and love of one another. That's the, the beginning of this new kingdom. Just the beginning. He's not the last fruits. He's the first fruits. Someone noticed this weekend that I always refer to the Old and New Testament as the Older and Newer Testament. It's very intentional because we fail to grasp that the entire Bible, the entire thing, all, all of it is about Jesus. We think rightly so that the story isn't important until Jesus enters into the story, but we think that that's the New Testament, but it's not. It's the entire book from the very first page. There's a story in the Older Testament. There was a man named Israel. He was the namesake of the nation. He had 12 sons. One of them, Joseph, was treated poorly by his brothers and by well he, he's treated poorly because he tells his brothers and his family that someday that they will bow down before him his own brothers his own people put him into this this pit in the ground because they didn't like him saying that they didn't like the idea so they put him into a pit like 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 a hole in the ground. And then they led his father to believe that he was dead. He was sold into slavery and taken down to, to Egypt. But while he travels to Egypt as a victim, so he goes down there as a captive and as a victim uh, and as a dead man, hated by his people, he rises to be the ruler of Egypt. Now, God was orchestrating this entire thing. This is actual history, but God is orchestrating this to paint a picture. See, drought and famine eventually came to Joseph's family in Israel, and they had to come down to Egypt. And if it wasn't for Joseph going there before them, then they would have traveled there as victims themselves. But because he did go first, when they arrived, they arrived as family to the king. It's an amazing story. And, and God used this pattern to foreshadow Jesus. You see, Egypt becomes a picture of death and as Joseph goes down into Egypt, Jesus goes down into death. See, Jesus, like Joseph, was hated and mistreated by his own people. Joseph told his family that he would, they would one day bow to him. And, and Jesus came talking about a kingdom where he was king. Told his own people that he was the Messiah. And so they treated him poorly. They didn't like that. They killed him. And they put him in the ground. Just like Joseph was placed in a pit in the ground. He became dead to his family. Jesus truly died and was placed in the grave. 
Joseph went to Egypt as a victim, but rose to be ruler. So Jesus went into death as a victim, but he rose as victor over death. And when Joseph's family came to Egypt because they ran out of food, picturing them descending into death themselves, then they went as victims. But Joseph went before them and he became the ruler. And so to their surprise, they were welcomed as family to the king and, and they were given food. And as heirs with Christ, when we enter death as victims, because Jesus has gone before us, because he has defeated death and instead made it a place of plenty, we come not as victims, but we come as family to the King. This is the glorious message of resurrection. We jump and we cheer and we celebrate because the one who we love is alive. And the one who is alive loves us. He forged the path. He didn't even forge it for himself. He's God. Death had no claim on him, but he jumped down death's throat for us. There is resurrection in Jesus. There is power in Jesus. There is love and purpose and mission in Jesus. There's a better kingdom in King Jesus. And it's here. We don't need to wait. It's, it's here now. He brought it when he stepped out of the grave, when he walked out of the tomb, he introduced this kingdom. In Jesus, our life has no end. Therefore, the life that we have now is eternal. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for raising Christ from the dead, for letting him to go into death and, and defeat victory for us. So as we, we will eventually, one day, assuming that Jesus doesn't come back before we pass, we will face that. We will face death, but it's already defeated. We, when we step into that uh, seemingly dark abyss, then our eyes will open to the glory of Jesus. We will arrive there as, as family to the King. So Father, we thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that we would embrace this kingdom today, now that we would, we would begin uh, building the kingdom that your son has instituted, brought into this world. We are told that this world will burn up, but the things that we make and plant and grow and, and build that are based upon this eternal kingdom, they will survive, they will last into eternity, just as we will. So Lord, I pray you bless us. Lord, that you strengthen us, that you open our eyes to this resurrection that is not just simply Jesus's, but it is ours. He is the first fruits and we will follow. Lord, we give you praise and thanks in the precious name of Jesus. It's Resurrection Day. And I just, uh, I, I pray that you have a wonderful Resurrection Day. That you begin to embrace all that it means that Jesus has done for, for us, 
He didn't need it. He did it for us. And uh, I also pray that you open your Bibles and read about this God who loves us so much. Each gospel tells us about how Jesus walked out of the grave. It's a true story. I know that it doesn't normally happen, but it happened. Happy Resurrection Day. Stay safe, stay healthy.